Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome back. This is Josie Daniel Burkett. You're familiar with her. She's been with us when we've had press conferences and disseminating information about hurricanes, which, as we mentioned last time we were here a few days ago, our experience in setting up lines of communication with and cooperation around the, the entire state among all the institutions with the hurricanes has given us a good network with which to work. In many cases, it's the same network to work with concerning uh, this virus and, and other such things. We, we do have some information for you, as, as you know, and which we'll be providing and answering your questions. And I'd urge everyone, again, all the people out there to, to get your information from these official sources. You don't want to respond to rumors and inaccurate information, but we'll be as full as complete as, as we can be uh, within the limits of what the various laws about privacy uh, prescribe. But uh, we thank you for being here, and we'll be glad. We have several presentations, and then uh, we'll answer questions. But I'll say at the beginning, this is precisely what we have been planning for in this, in, with this virus. We are communicating, cooperating. We have the all hands are, are on deck, and we're following the standard operating procedures that have been, been planned and that you've heard of, about. And there's, there's no reason for alarm. We ask people to, to go about your daily lives with the understanding that there is a, a new virus out there and that, that there are ways to protect yourself from it. So with that, I'll ask Dr. Rick Toomey of DHEC if you would please come forward. Dr. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. As you know, we are currently conducting investigations into two possible cases of the coronavirus in South Carolina. We understand that many of you may have concerns about how this may impact South Carolinians. As the state's lead for public health, DHEC is taking pro proactive steps to be prepared to protect the public's health, including informing healthcare providers of recommendations for testing, the availability of testing, and the appropriate precautions for the public. We are sharing with you this information as we get it. As you are aware, late yesterday afternoon, we had two presumptive positive tests for the coronavirus. Our decision was to release this information in a quick fashion so that has led us to now start the process of the investigations for those two possible coronaviruses. Those specimens have been sent to the CDC's lab for confirmation testing. The N1H1, SCARS, and others, including the current flu season. Together we have trained, prepared, and put systems into place to ensure that we are prepared to respond to this and other events. I am joined here today by Dr. Linda Bell, our state epidemiologist. Dr. Bell and her team have been hard at work coordinating with our state, federal, and local partners throughout this event. We are still learning much about the virus. We are committed to keeping the public informed. This includes establishing a dedicated website, SouthCarolinaDHEC.gov backslash COVID-19, that's C-O-V-I-D-19. And this site will help answer the many questions that citizens might have. As we learn more, we will make sure to keep you informed on the latest information as we receive it. I now turn the floor over to Dr. Linda Bell for an update on our um, ongoing investigations and what we know so far. Dr. Bell. Thank you, Director Toomey. Good morning. Late yesterday afternoon, DHEC received presumptive positive results for two individuals who tested for the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. It's important to note that the two cases are unrelated. As we reported last night, one patient is a woman in Charleston County who is currently self-isolated at home, 
and recently returned from a trip to France and Italy. She has a mild illness and does not require medical treatment. The other patient is a woman in Kershaw County who is currently hospitalized and in isolation. The Kershaw County woman has no known exposure at this time. The possible source of her infection is still being investigated. She was transferred from a hospital in uh, Kershaw County to another hospital in Midlands to, to provide an appropriate level of care as her needs uh, see. As part of all of our initial notification processes, DHEC works to identify the close contacts of possible cases who may have been exposed. This helps us to identify those who may be at risk and to prevent the spread of disease. While health risk to the general public in the United States and South Carolina remains low, our primary goal is prevention and control. We understand that residents have concerns about how the virus may impact South Carolinians. We are encouraging the public to remain calm. There is no evidence of ongoing transmission in South Carolina at this time. There is no reason to alter your daily routines other than to continue to be vigilant about keeping germs from spreading by covering coughs and sneezes, washing hands frequently with warm soap and water, and staying home when sick. DHEC has been, in, uh, has been conducting investigations year-round of, of many communicable diseases. So we have been preparing for the introduction of this virus in South Carolina for weeks. Our medical consultants conduct more than 700 disease investigations each year for a variety of illnesses. We have planned, prepared, and tested our ability to respond to public health threats like COVID-19. And we have developed strong relationships with healthcare providers through the years. I also want to reaffirm to the public that our planning and preparations have created a system that is working. The medical professionals who uh, presided over each patient's care followed CDC's and DHEC guidance and took the appropriate steps to recommend their respective patients for testing for COVID-19. DHEC then consulted with those medical professionals, agreed that the patients met the recommendations for testing, and proceeded with the testing at the state's public health lab. Again, we encourage the public to remain calm and to continue to practice daily precautions to prevent the spread of germs, washing your hands frequently, covering your cough, staying home when you're sick, and appropriately disposing of tissues and other items that have potentially been contaminated. While we understand that there is a lot of interest, we are still learning about the virus and investigating this situation. As we learn more, and when cases are confirmed, we will continue to update you as quickly and as timely as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Dave Cole, President of Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you for allowing me to join you and Dr. Toomey here today. In regards to the situation facing our state, MUSC's roles are several layers, there's several folds here. To collaborate with our state partners, to help provide and reinforce important health information, to provide expert care and testing support, and to pro promote new ways and new treatments as available and as soon as possible. MUSC released a statement last night about a presumed positive patient case. She's a member of our MUSC family. I'd like to take a moment to reinforce it and acknowledge that this person is doing, doing the right thing. She has been following protocol. She's been making the right decisions. The system has been working. And I want to thank her for that. It's important. The other piece of information, too, piece of information I'd like to share with you today, MUSC has been working with state partners to create better access to COVID-19 testing. The idea is to be able to deliver local testing with rapid turnaround time. When, this, when these efforts become available, and we would anticipate very soon, 
We will release that information, the process, and how that will affect and enable us all to have better capability in this domain. Finally, I'd like to announce that as of this morning, MUSC is offering a free, urgent virtual care platform for people in South Carolina experiencing mild to moderate flu-like symptoms. Simply sign on to MUSC.care and use the code COVID-19. Experienced providers will treat symptoms, provide information, and give direction. At this moment, I'd like to then ask Dr. Ed O'Brien to the podium. Ed is our director of MUSC Virtual Care Platform, and he's going to give a little more detail and walk you through what this looks like. Thank you, Dr. Cole, Governor. Um, so we've been preparing in South Carolina uh, for events like these uh, and, and been prepared to address them uh, through telemedicine. Uh, this is really because of the governor's and the legislative support in making uh, South Carolina a true leader in telemedicine in the nation. We're only one of only two nationally certified telehealth centers of excellence in the United States. So we are prepared in terms of telemedicine. With our platform, you can receive care from a group of trusted MUSC doctors, nurse practitioners, and PAs from your home anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. If you have flu-like symptoms, or if you just have questions, and are anywhere in South Carolina, you can log on to www.musc.care, or just musc.care, and access the COVID-19 concerns area of the platform. At that point, you'll answer a series of questions. An MUSC provider can treat your symptoms and give you advice on what to do from there, or they may want to speak to you in person if your symptoms warrant that. Uh, the ways they may contact you are by phone, video, or chat. We're making this free to anyone in South Carolina. Just use the promo code COVID-19, C-O-V-I-D-1-9. You'll need to use that code at the uh, payment screen, and you'll see there's a place to type in a promo code. This is a great tool to get care without being exposed or exposing others to whatever illness you may have. Just remember, the flu is still very rampant in South Carolina, and we can treat that with telemedicine as well. We believe this platform will make a tremendous impact to the people of our state. Thank you, Doctor. Are there any questions? I'll say, as you can see, we are, we are prepared to the nth degree. The protocols, procedures are established. Uh, these, these two patients did precisely what has been advised to do. That is, if you feel like you're sick, you call your doctor, and if necessary, you go, go to the hospital and, uh, and will be, be tested uh, as they were. So uh, are there any questions for anyone? Yes. So yes, the, the patient in Charleston, how did she come back from Europe? And are other people being tested? I'm guessing maybe she was on the airplane. <laughs> are those people being tested as well? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, she did return by a flight. Um, and again, the protocol is what is normal. We are working with her on her flight schedule, communicating back to the CDC so the CDC can implement their protocols and looking at uh, individuals that may be at risk. Did she come back through Charleston or what airport was it? She came back through Charleston. When? Uh, over a week ago. Is she one of the 13 that do you have with monitoring? No. You mentioned that her condition was at home. She's self-isolating. Uh, how is her current condition? How is she feeling right now? And then also the current condition, how is the other individual feeling right now? I can uh, answer the question about the uh, Charleston patient. Uh, she actually is doing quite well um, and had uh, mild symptoms for about 24, 36 hours. When you say symptoms, sir, just for clarification purposes, what type of symptoms so that if anyone at home is, is watching right now, what should they be mindful of? I would refer you to, for example, the virtual care platform where it's specifically what the guidelines are and what things you would look for. Flu-like symptoms are generally what you would uh, expect in this sort of context. Governor, I have a question for you. Is the idea of issuing the state of emergency on the table right now, or is it too early at this it's point? It's too early for that. This, this is going precisely as we 
believed it would. Uh, we, as I say, we all the protocols, the procedures, the, the people are all uh, stood up, alert, activated. We have the systems to respond. It's so it's, uh, it's way too early for any of those kinds of considerations. This is, but again, this is we'd urge people to to follow the, the instructions that have given by been given by virtually every healthcare person of, of, on television in Washington to, to locally about wash your hands, cover your face if you sneeze or cough. Um, if you're sick, uh, go home, uh, and call the doctor. And, and now we know with this, with this new telehealth uh, availability, you don't need to go to a doctor to get some information if you feel better staying at home and asking, answering some questions or on on, on the internet with MUSC and then possibly speaking to a healthcare provider there. That's a, that is a big, big help and a big convenience. But again, it's an indication of how well prepared we are here in, in South Carolina. The elderly woman in Kershaw, was she in a nursing home? Obviously, a nursing home was a big thing in Washington State. No, she was not in a nursing home prior to becoming ill. Okay, so she, she lived alone or are other people being tested around her? We conduct contact investigations around every person who's um, identified, and so the uh, close contacts are, are being investigated and appropriate measures are being taken to evaluate them should they develop symptoms of illness or to um, place them um, under quarantine for 14 days to make sure that they don't become ill and expose others. And because she was hospitalized, how do you ensure other people in the hospital don't get sick? Well, all hospitals know the protocols to follow for appropriate um, isolation depending on the patient's condition, and so they're observing the appropriate infection control procedures. Can you give updated numbers um, on the cases that are being monitored actively right now? Are the people being monitored? Yes, we're, that is posted on our website. And how many test kits do you have available? We have test kits available to test between 80 and 100 patients per day. Approximately how many total health test kits do you have? Say again, please. Approximately how many total yeah. kits at this current time do you happen to know that the state has? Um, I believe we have about a thousand. And are you able to speak specifically to the senior citizen who is in the hospital? How is she feeling right now? She's been transferred to an appropriate level of care for her needs. And we otherwise don't comment on the, the status of individuals' um, health conditions. Can you give them an age or age range for both patients? Um, the, the woman from uh, Kershaw County is in her 80s. The woman from Charleston is in her 30s. And this woman in Kershaw County, are you guys considering community spread when it comes to how she contracted or possibly contracted the virus? So we're still investigating the potential source of her investigation, any possible contacts that she may have had to identify the source. The Kershaw County patient, is that, uh, is her condition considered life-threatening? I, I can't comment on her um, individual medical condition. Kershaw was a week ago, correct me if I'm wrong, and the, um, the senior citizen currently in the hospital, when was she first tested? The, the person in the, the Kershaw County resident was first tested on the test was submitted to RDHEC lab on March the 5th. And that is the, the, we received both of those specimens on the same day and they were resulted out on the same day. So people living in Kershaw County, since we don't know the exact way this woman possibly contracted the virus, do they need to take any additional precautions right now other than what you guys have already suggested? No, we don't re recommend any additional measures than those that we have already communicated that are known to be effective in preventing the spread of uh, respiratory illnesses that are spread by respiratory droplets. And Governor McMaster, have you had any conversations with the Vice President or the President about um, federal help in response to this here in the state? Uh, with the Vice President, yes, not with the President uh, personally, but we've been in contact with them and Secretary Azar uh, constantly, constant communication. And what was your conversation with the vice president? Did you ask him for anything specifically you need help with, or what was that conversation? No, he, he was assuring us all that, that the, whatever is, is necessary uh, will, will be done. But again, back to the contact, we know that this is spread through person-to-person -person contact. Contact or contact where I have the 
uh, virus and touch the table and leave droplets there and then you touch the table and that is contact. So that's, that is how it is spread. It, it is not an airborne <coughs> virus. And the person in Kershaw, I, I just, to, I think this was already said, that she is in a Columbia hospital now? Uh, she's been transferred to a hospital in the Midlands. When was she transferred? She was transferred yesterday. Are there any more questions? For the NUSC online telemedicine, it's probably a question for uh, NUSC staff. I, I assume that since the test has to be administered in person, there wouldn't be, a, you wouldn't be able to make a positive diagnosis. Uh, so if someone goes through this and they're suspected to have coronavirus, what's the next step for that patient? The next step is uh, referring them to appropriate resources if they are high risk for a complication and meet CDC guidelines for testing. Uh, we also will be giving everyone resources to self-quarantine, uh, symptoms to look out for, and we can treat symptoms uh, as well. Resources like what, sir? Uh, all the resources posted to the CDC uh, website, uh, resources uh, that tell you some of it is infection control, uh, what to do, just like the governor was saying, uh, when to wash your hands, when to uh, isolate yourself, what isolation means. A lot of people don't understand that, so it means staying away from people, uh, what time period to isolate yourself, uh, when you feel like you might not need to be on isolation. It also gives you ideas on, on what does put you at risk for contracting the virus, uh, travel locations, uh, contact with known cases, things like that. So these resources, and correct me if I'm wrong, sir, these resources are information, not physical supplies that will be sent to people. That is correct. That is correct. Thank you, sir. And, and not to be flippant, but you can't obviously know from an app whether someone has a cold or a flu or coronavirus. So what, I mean, how, what does the app accomplish than someone just going to a doctor? Sure. Uh, you, you, you can accomplish actually quite a bit through telemedicine and an app. Uh, so we call it equivalent care. So your uh, physician, when you go to the doctor, can frequently tell the difference between a flu and a cold or another kind of virus. So we can do that through the app as well. Uh, and you're using a constellation of clinical symptoms and clinical gestalt uh, to make a diagnosis. But as far as a physical testing kit, that cannot be done through that. And do you know how many cases of actual flu and deaths of flu we've had in this state this season? That information is also posted on the DHEC website on our, in our weekly flu watch. What is it? Do you have some, can you give us some numbers? You're looking for some numbers? That would be nice. So to, uh, because there is such a large number of cases, I really advise you to go to the DHEC website because it gives the breakdown of the number of flu cases by um, region and the number of deaths, by age group. So there's a wealth of information and to get all the details that you need, um, it's really best that you visit the website to get the full report that's posted weekly. So these two cases will be confirmed after further testing from the CDC or are they already confirmed to have the coronavirus? The, the protocol is that if there's a presumptive positive, we send the test uh, specimens to the CDC and 24 to 48 hours, they'll issue a confirmation or let us know that it's a false positive. But the, they will confirm it. For those who don't have a medical background who are just trying to stay informed, would you be so kind as to explain why it's presumed positive at this time? Uh, that has to do with the introduction of a new test kit. The CDC released this, uh, the test kits to state public health labs mm -hmm. just a few weeks ago and it's required that when a new laboratory begins performing a new test, the CDC has to validate those results. So the, what it means is that when the state lab runs a test, we call that, and gets a positive, we call that a presumptive positive. And then the CDC that has developed the test will run the same specimen and will validate the result and give a confirmed positive. How do you guys confirm that these people who are self-isolated in their homes, I guess how do you monitor them to make sure that they're not interacting with people, not leaving their homes to spread this? So they're given, and just a clarification, isolation is for individuals who are ill. And the individuals that we are monitoring are for people who have not developed symptoms and are being monitored for the possibility of symptoms. And so they are given information on symptoms to watch for, to check their temperature on a daily basis, and what symptoms to report uh, should they become ill. That's the monitoring procedure. 
The isolation is for individuals who are already ill, and they are to stay home and away from public places until their illness resolves. But how do you make sure they don't do that? Do because they're in contact with, um, depending on their, uh, the individuals who are ill um, are in, this is through an agreement, and if they violate that agreement, then we can impose more stringent measures. But um, we, uh, we have ways of, of monitoring all of these indi individuals by having health department staff stay in close touch with them. Stringent measures like what? Uh, to, to require them and to enforce isolation measures so that if, if it's not voluntary, if they're not cooperative, then we can impose uh, legal measures to require them to be um, to detain and, and monitored or enforced at a higher level. Would those be officers or what, what, what would that look like? It would, uh, so it would depend on a case-by-case -case basis. We do this for other communicable diseases, and in some instances, it would mean that they have to be put under a certain, in a certain facility or certain lockdown. If individuals are well enough to be kept at home, um, the vast majority of them will have symptoms that will resolve in a matter of a few days. And so moving to that next level of mandatory isolation is unlikely to be required. And can you talk about, I know um, the woman from Charleston had returned home, I think you believe, you said a week ago, um, and you had done the testing yesterday, um, or the 5th. Can you talk about when the state first became aware of the potential even before the testing was done? Like when were you first aware of both patients? Um, it was first reported to the state a, a few days after her onset of illness. So she, um, the onset of illness is believed to be around February the 28th. Uh, she first sought care, I believe, on March the 2nd. She was um, reported to the health department on March the 5th. The specimen was collected on that day, and the result was reported out the following day. Was she in contact with the school? Anything needed for schools to be aware of? No. And the Kershaw patient, when was that brought to your awareness? She had a more prolonged course of illness, and she was um, admitted to a hospital for evaluation of an mm -hmm. unknown illness. And so the course of her illness is a bit more prolonged. The other diagnostic tests were performed to, um, to find out what was the cause of her illness. And when those diagnostic tests were negative, they began considering the possibility of COVID-19. And so the, the course of uh, her evaluation is a bit more prolonged. We were being told that uh, D had been <coughs> testing people who had recently returned from either Italy, China, or Iran. Um, is that the case? DHEC is monitoring individuals who have traveled to impacted areas, and should they develop symptoms, they are uh, encouraged to seek medical care in an appropriate way, and the decisions made whether or not testing is indicated depending on the presentation of their illness. So even if someone has not left the state in the last three, four weeks, if they develop symptoms that are consistent with coronavirus, that's something you would still test for. That's correct. And going back to the personal woman, you said it was more prolonged. Can you describe what that means? I mean, did she get sick in January or February? Or? Uh, no, she was, uh, it was in, uh, she was admitted in February, and she was being evaluated over the course of several days for other potential causes until they decided that those had been ruled out. And like then she was tested. Like early February? Like, give me a time frame. Um, I, I don't have the exact dates of her original. These are still things, the details are being investigated. But go, go to one of your earlier questions about this, what MUSC has set up does eliminate a trip to the doctor. You can doctor essentially comes to you and then depending on what the results of that transfer of information uh, are then the next step will be taken so that's a, a, a very uh, important thing that we have here in the state that we've been preparing for and it's we're putting it to use now the senior citizen woman she um who is currently in the hospital to the best of your knowledge as of right now she has not left the state before recently or at all before becoming ill that's correct. We don't have a, a history that she has traveled outside of um, the United States and outside of South Carolina. Doesn't that indicate there are more cases in South Carolina? Well, at this time, we're still investigating a potential source of her infection. 
Do people need to be concerned about a community spread? Community spread is one possibility as her source if uh, she has no history of travel. And we're continuing to investigate to see if she had contact with someone who did potentially travel elsewhere and then that would make this case a connection to a travel associated case. And we're still working to uh, investigate all of those details. How accurate are your, uh, how accurate are the tests that y'all are administering to get this exact 19 virus or could she just the woman in Kershaw kind of could she just have the common flu and it's a false positive that is a possibility and that is the reason that we have sent specimens to the CDC to validate the results that we have in South Carolina as a percentage how accurate are the tests that y'all perform to say it is this exact virus the test kit that's available is specific for the diagnosis of COVID-19 and not other conditions. And we believe it's a highly reliable test. So no number, you can't give me a number? I, I don't, I can't give, because it's a new test, I can't give you the number of the sensitivity and the specificity of this particular test for detecting this particular virus. But we believe that it is um, highly reliable. Schools and businesses across the state, anything differently that they should be doing right now, now that we have two possible cases here? No, the hospital cases, we are confident that the, the, uh, the there's a only one hospital case. Um, and so in the two healthcare facilities that that patient has been in, we are confident that the isolation precautions that are taken are, um, are following the recommendations. The healthcare workers are using personal protective equipment and observing the isolation measures that are taken in all hospitals for respiratory illnesses. As far as other things to do in the community, there's no um, indication at this time for businesses, schools, or others that anything different be done because there's no evidence of ongoing spread in the community. For Governor McMaster, uh, the Deputy Director of Commerce was here the other day, the last time we had a uh, press conference here. He talked a little bit about how businesses could see some of the impacts of coronavirus. To the best of your knowledge, how has that changed? Are we still seeing, are businesses still seeing the effects of coronavirus? How's that changed? Well, those, those that deal with parts that come from China, of course, a lot of those routes have been disrupted, and that is primarily what the, he was speaking of when he was describing that. But uh, the, there may be other disruptions at a later date, but so far we are, the uh, businesses always have alternative plans for finding parts for vehicles or for manufacturing parts, and a lot of that, of course, I said, is what's been coming from China. So a lot of that is, is, uh, is disrupted at this time. But uh, our businesses are strong, and again, we, there's a lot of communication uh, going on. And again, because of the hurricanes and weather conditions like that, we are, are, are familiar with uh, making having alternative routes and things of that nature. So there may be some impact there, but uh, there's no way to measure that at this point. Talking about hospital procedure with the woman uh, in a hospital here, is that hospital still open for visitors, things like that, and this woman's just in isolation where she needs to be, or can you talk about access to that hospital? There, there's no reason for the hospital to change their admission, admission procedures um, because they observe these isolation measures for other conditions all the time. So there's, there's nothing different that the hospitals need to do that have provided care for this patient. I think that's one of the main points we want to have with all the people is that the, the, the steps, the provisions, the precautions that we've been uh, talking about from the beginning and recommending are the, the same things you're hearing from the CDC and others in uh, national experts on these things. And we have some, some here are, are to wash your hands, cover your mouth, stay away from people sneezing and coughing. And if you feel sick, go home. And if you feel it is necessary, call the doctor. And this has pretty much been covered, but I have to ask specifically uh, large events we've got coming up, St. Patty's Day, uh, bridge run, that kind of thing. Any. Any changes to major events? Not a change. We're, we're proceeding precisely as we've been proceeding from the beginning, urging people to take those, urging people to take those, those precautions. Because again, it's it's not an airborne virus. I mean, it's not floating in the air like chicken pox and I think some <coughs> flus. This is something you have to have some contact 
with the, the droplets that have come from another person. You have to have some sort of contact. So as long as you're not the dementia, you'd be fine. And this elderly woman who was in the health system for a while getting tested for different things, have other people who were there been exposed to this? Were they following protocols for the coronavirus? Or is there a possibility that some healthcare workers were exposed to it when they didn't know what exactly it could be? So even prior to the time that her diagnosis was confirmed, as soon as the COVID-19 became even a possibility, the healthcare facility took measures to place her in isolation and to make sure that all of the healthcare workers were observing uh, appropriate measures to protect themselves with personal protective equipment. We, have, uh, we are investigating all the potential contacts and, um, and we'll be monitoring those individuals for potential signs of um, illness in all of those contacts. So there, there is an investigation uh, that's done all the time, contact investigations around uh, infectious cases to make sure that we identify all those who are exposed to observe for possible signs of symptoms and to prevent additional spread should they become ill. And how long can the virus live on the surface, exactly? Um, that varies on the conditions, the, the, everything from the humidity, the heat, and it can range from a few hours and it could be as long as a few days in certain very special um, circumstances. So the, uh, again, the importance of frequently washing your hands is very important and is protective. Uh, and in certain settings, the, uh, the need for environmental cleaning is indicated and that's done in hospital settings and in other areas where um, it, illnesses may have been recognized. And just to clarify, since we're also in the middle of flu season for people you know, not in the medical field, I guess what are the two distinctions or differences between the flu and the coronavirus? Obviously there must be a lot. Well, the symptoms that they cause are similar. They both cause a, a, a febrile illness, or meaning an illness that presents with fever and upper respiratory symptoms with a dry cough and, uh, uh, and sneezing. And so the, um, the ability to make a distinction between those illnesses with a diagnostic test is important because, the, because flu is circulating so widely in the community, it's much more likely that people who present with those symptoms will actually have the flu or other common respiratory illnesses. So that's why we run the diagnostic test on individuals if these other illnesses have been ruled out so that we can identify COVID-19. Any more questions? Well, we thank you very much for coming and we will keep you up to date. Thank you.